All right, we're on. We're in uh, chapter one of the um, industrial networking book. No, we're not. Industrial electronics. The industrial networking class doesn't have a book, so we can't be in that book. All right, so I'm looking at page three. And I see there's significant events in uh, manufacturing. And I see that in 1801, we have punch cards operating a Texel machine, making your shirts. So 1801. And um, I see that in 1834, we have our first computer. And in 1990, we have... Uh, Tulsa demonstrating a uh, electronic control circuit on his boat, remote electronic control system. So, 1890, I'm doing some, I'm doing some RF uh, radio frequency controls for my boat. If I can spell control, con t c o n t r o l. There we go. That's pretty good. And. Uh, 1904, we were using vacuum tubes to change AC to DC. Now, that, that's an interesting idea because, so we're, we're, going, we're taking AC and we're changing it to DC. Edison decided that we should have a DC power grid. And he had a DC power grid going in New York City um, before 1904. And then Tulsa decided, and, and Westinghouse decided that we ought to have an AC power grid. The AC people want out. So now that we have AC, now we have to use vacuum tube diodes to get our DC back because we threw away the, the DC generation portion that we used to have. So what comes around goes around. 1909, um, now Lee Forest lived in Shenandoah or Clarinda? I think it was Shenandoah, right? Lita Forest. He lived here in Council Bluffs. But but uh, when I came here 17 years ago, um, Lita Forest was the name of the the wing of the school that has the F in front of it now. So F105 is, is that F stands for forest. And what what he did, he um, he made a vacuum tube amplifier. And he was, um, he changed the way we do AM radio. And in fact, in the 30s, um, the FCC wasn't really there, and you really didn't really have many rules for what you do with a radio, AM radio station. And what, uh, during the day, AM radio waves don't go very far. They don't promulgate any more than 100 miles or so. And it doesn't matter if you have 100 watts or 1,000 watts or 100,000 watts they're not going to promulgate very far because the sun wins. Uh, but at night, when the sun goes down, um, AM radio waves go s skipping across the atmosphere, and they can go halfway around the world. So at night, he had, he had raised the, his wattage up to a million watts, and, and Hawaii could pick him up on an AM radio. All right, 1919, 60 years since uh, production output was increased uh, 30 times 3 and blah, blah, blah. Okay, wait a Very good. First electric propelled automated control pipeline, 1927. Now, who wanted pipelines anyway? It was Rockefeller. So Rockefeller, uh, who's the head of Standard Oil, um, was transferring his oil, using the railroads to transfer his oil, and the railroad guys were upping the fees, and so he decided he'd make a pipeline to transfer his oil on. Now, um, in today's world, do we pollute a lot in the United States? Nah. Nah, that's it. In, in, in 1890, we were, we were using, we were taking our oil and we were refining it and we were making kerosene to light our cities, to light our houses. And a byproduct of that 
process uh, process was gasoline, and it was being thrown away. So so think of a time when when my refineries were throwing away the gasoline byproduct because it was useless, and the and the pollution that that's causing in Ohio compared to the, the manufacturing processes we do now. You know the green people would be. Would, uh, are all upset because of the way we do things now. And, you know, in, in I can remember having the discussion with my grandmother uh, whether she should sell her uh, Con Edison stock. And Con Edison owns nuclear power plants around Chicago. And she thought she should sell it because nuclear power plants are, are such polluters. And I said, Grandma, um, do you remember growing up having a white Christmas? Do you guys remember having a white Christmas in your lifetime? Yeah. Could you imagine never having a white Christmas? You know, my grandmother, from the time she was born to the mid 50s, never had a white Christmas. Why not? Because the coal was being used to heat all the homes. The coal was putting black stuff on the white snow. So we had coal soot on, over all of our major cities, all of our industrial areas, and, and we, there was no such thing as a white Christmas. The snow was covered and it was black. Now, that was good because that, that, was, that made you could go down the road, it was, it was good for traction with your car, right? But. You know, because we went and switched from using that coal to heat our houses, and now we're using that coal only to make our electricity, and we're doing it more smarter with the electrical stuff that we do. You know, we're not seeing that type of pollution anymore. So that's really cool. Anyway, 1923. Vacuum tubes used to control a DC motor. Um, Walter Schottke. Native German invents a, uh, a semiconductor diode, 1938. So just before World War II, we get a, a, a semiconductor thing that's going to change the way we do business. So the control systems in World War II on our ships were mostly magnetic amplifier control systems. So think of a... a uh, a transformer with multiple coils of wire in it, and I have a feedback one, and I've got an, an amplifying one. I have for one for slope, and I'm controlling what I'm controlling my guns using that. Today we wouldn't do that. We would use semiconductors and semiconductor logic to do that type of thing. But uh, when the Bismarck went to sea, the reason it sank is because the Germans, how many Germans we got in the room? No Germans? I'm, I'm at least 30, 75% German. The Germans, who, who so the superior race that they are, made an unsinkable ship and made control systems in their anti-aircraft guns so they could shoot down the planes. So what you do is you'd set your, your control knob for the type of plane you have and then you'd aim at the plane, and the, the gun would fire in the right spot so that the bullet would hit the plane. And uh, when the, the uh, now picture the Bismarck's coming out of the North Sea, and up from the south comes the Ark Royal, a aircraft carrier that was sent to, um, to Singapore in 1921 with a set of planes, biplanes, that were never updated. Okay, So the Ark Royal has, has biplanes on it. No, no other aircraft carrier on the planet Earth is using fly biplanes at this time during the war. Uh, not even us, and we're not even in the war yet. We're not even going to be in the war for another year. right? So um, anyway, when the, German, the Germans didn't have a position to set their their anti-aircraft guns to that was less than the best plane that could possibly attack us, right? Nor did they have a manual position. And for those of you who are German that didn't claim to be German, you'll know that 
when given an order, you will follow it directly. Okay, that's, that's part of our makeup. So if I'm trained that my sight will be on the plane and I'm missing the plane, okay, I'm not going to change where I'm shooting. I'm a German. I follow orders, right? Exactly. And so, so that's what I'm doing. And so the, the, uh, the first wave of planes came in for the Arc Royal. Everyone missed. All, all the plane, all the biplanes, they dropped their torpedoes too far away. The Bismarck got maneuvered, got away from them. And uh, all those planes went back. The Admiral got on the phone, got on the announcing system, telling, telling the crew, we just, we just blew up 25 planes that tried to attack us, those losing British, you know, whatever. The British guys go back to their aircraft carrier, reload. The pilots sit around in their pilot room and, what did we do wrong? None of us hit anything. You know, can't we do better than this? We're British. You know, we're supposed to have a naval history, right? And they're all sitting there looking at their naval, wondering, well, they can't see their naval because they're too damn fat. Anyway, <laughs> the, so, the, 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 so somebody has the brilliant idea of, why don't we shoot our torpedoes closer to the Bismarck? I mean, they didn't, they couldn't hit any of our planes. What are, why are we afraid of? Okay. So the second wave comes out and closes to the Bismarck and, and gets some hits. Now, the hits on the, on the main part of the ship are irrelevant. I mean, the, the, the armor is, um, 28 inches thick of, um, of not steel, but, um, a, um, special iron that they did. Um, they have a, a <coughs> torpedo boat around, uh, a, a ter uh, torpedo belt around the ship to protect it. But as luck, when God's on your side, that's all that matters, right? So God was on the side of the British, and one of the torpedoes missed the target and hit the rudder, <laughs> and, and and froze the rudder in in a position that wasn't straight. And the Germans, because they're such brilliant engineers had built a ship that couldn't maintain course with a rudder jammed over. The, the submarine force, U.S. submarine force, we, if our rudder is jammed over to the right, we can still make that submarine go in a straight line. We, we have that technology. We can, we can do that. But the, so now the Bismarck is there doing a circle in the ocean at 1,200 miles away from France. They, they have to get within a 1,000 mile radius of, of, of France in order for their air cover to come out and protect them. And they're, they're, just, they're just doing a circle there waiting for the Germans to show up and, and put ma massive number of rounds into them. Um, and uh, that's what happened to them. But it all had to do with a control system. A control system that we wouldn't use today. Now, in the U.S. Navy at the same time, all of our anti-aircraft stuff had a manual position, and our crews were being taught that they hit the damn plane. You know, we, every tenth round's a tracer round. Can't you tell? Can't you tell which one? Which one's yours? You know, and so we were, we were doing better, but we still, um, prior to the um, silicone control rectifier coming on board. Um, in 1944, we were still, it took 10,000 rounds to get a plane in the Pacific Theater. Uh, with the proximity switches, the radio controlled proximity switches we had for our 40 millimeter guns, after 1944, it only took 2,000 rounds. So that's just one of those things. All right, back to what we're doing here. 1947, we, we invented the first transistor. Um, I can remember being eight years old and having a seven transistor radio. Wow, that was so awesome. I mean, just totally, totally awesome. And then, uh, yeah, turn the page, on uh, page four if anybody cares. Um, the f 1957 first solid state variable speed controller. Okay, right now we call that the, the uh, PF40 is the one that we have. We're going to be using it all the time. 
We have computers. Computers in industry? Wow. How can this be? An automated knitting machine. How can we kill off our fellow man with a knitting machine? I mean, really. I mean, how, what is going on here? First microprocessor, 1971. It was 1983. Yeah, 1983. Um, I was at summering school teaching the ensigns. And uh, we were keeping all of our grades manually. And I talked my boss into buying a, a Commodore 64. Yes, can you imagine a Commodore 64 and a tape, magnetic tape drive to save memory. And I wrote a program to save grades in. Talk about primitive language. Oh, gee, it was. But it worked. It worked, and I, I, I could print out. Your grades in great order. I can tell which of my supply officers are flunking. It was really wonderful. 1977, European Roebuck Company started. Apple in 78. I still have my Apple II at home, Apple IIc. I haven't plugged it in for about 15 years. And I still have my Commodore 128 at home with its uh, five and a half inch drive. I haven't plugged that in in probably 10 years trying to figure out how to throw it away. 1994, a 64-bit processor? What's going on here? We got a tag-based thing. Now we're doing device net in 2000. A wireless, wireless networks, broadband stuff. I don't, I don't understand. How can we, how can these things happen to us? Yeah, wireless data. Yeah, um, there are still engineers alive that I'll tell you that uh, 400 baud is the highest data transfer rate that can be can, can be done across a wire. Okay, that that the, the science is sound. The physics is there. It was being taught in the 50s and 60s. We can never get above 400 baud. Uh, and and the, what's what's a baud? Anybody know? Anybody care? Yeah, yeah. No one cares. You don't care. Anyway, so the, the, the thing is, I, I got this copper wire, and I want a signal that goes up, and I want it goes down, and then I want it to go up, and I want it to go down, right? And um, and this guy here, I want another one that goes up, and I want it to stay down. So I got a I got a one zero. Well, I probably got a one one, and then I got a one zero that I'm transmitting. And if that's what I'm doing, and I'm doing it with voltage, then um, the science says, the physics says, I can't be any faster than 400 baht. And uh, if you think about it as in, in bits per second, what's 8 times 4? Anybody know what 8 times 4 is? All right, so that'd be 3,200 bits per second. So about 3.2 kilohertz is what we're talking about. So um, our, we were stuck at 3.2 kilohertz modems for about 10 years because the science told us we couldn't go by it until somebody figured out how to get by it. And then we went to faster and faster and faster and faster ones. But even 20 years ago, you would have found uh, a whole lot of literature telling you why you can't get above 3.2 kilohertz. So a baud means that's how many 8-bit words can be sent, is what that means. OK. So I'm on page 5, and we have um, th this chapter 1 is mostly a English chapter where we discuss words that we use otherwise in different ways, but now we're going to use them in a manufacturing way. So um, we have a project. Wow, something with many parts. Yeah. We have a job shop, someplace we sit around, drink our coffee, eat our donuts. We have something that's repetitive. So if something's going to happen over and over and over and over again, that'd be something that I could 
automate, right? So I have a repetitive process. So I'm, when I'm knitting a sweater, I knit and then I purl and then I knit and then I purl, right? Anybody ever do that? Anybody know the difference between knitting and purling? Not. Or am I just making that up? Okay, how many thinks I'm making knitting and purling up? And how many know that because they watch your grandmother that I'm not blowing smoke by it? Yeah, and the rest of you have no clue. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but if we had a library that had real books in it, then we could go to the library and get a book and that tell us how to knit and purl. Something that's repetitive. Uh, we have a line. You know, an automobile line where I, I the automobile goes down and I and I make it, and at the end of the line I have a finished product. I have a continuous process. Now, now that we jumped to continuous process, um, remember last semester when I told you my idea of um, mining the asteroid belt, sending up robots to the asteroid belt and, and do mining up there. Yeah, the National Geographic for this for uh, this month has an article on ex exploration of space, and uh, one, some company in California uh, has multi-billionaires backing a process where they're going to mine the asteroid belt with with robots. Well, I know, so I'm a little bit behind on my financing, but the idea is still there. All right. So I'm on page six, I'm on page seven, and I have machines that are manual, machines that are programmable, I have robots doing stuff, I got material that has to be moved, I gotta track the material, I gotta store the material, I have to be flexible in my manufacturing cell. So if I, I make something that only, I make a manufacturing cell that only makes 22 caliber bullets, that's all it does. Okay, that's good. How many how many more years are we going to use 22 caliber bullets, <coughs> shorts and longs? Long time, right? Forever and ever, right? <coughs> Until the Congress of the United States bans the ammunition, and then the, the that manufacturing cell will be totally <coughs> useless because that's all it can do, right? So, the uh, uh, in Schindler's list. Sure, sure, I'm pretty sure it was in Schindler's list. We had a manufacturing guy in Germany making ammunition for the Third Reich, and at night he would go and adjust the equipment so it would not be <coughs> accordance to spec. And then he'd ship it, and then you'd use it in your weapon, and it wouldn't work. So it would jam your, your Luger, your 40 milligram your gun wouldn't fire, and now it's got something jammed in it. And, <coughs> and um, he ended up spending the whole war doing that, and no one caught him on it. No. But there's a, a um, I don't know if you remember the movie or not, but there's a, there's a scene where the, where the uh, Gestapo bring out the, the, uh, the rabbi to blow his brains out. You know, they, they take out their Luger and boom, it doesn't work, shit, let me try yours, boom, it doesn't work, shit. <laughs> and now you have three Gasapo guys that are trying to make their weapons work, and the, and the rabbi gets up and walks back in, shaking his head. I'm not sure that that actually happened, but, you know, it uh, made, made for a good movie. <coughs> Manufacturing system with industrial automation. So on page seven, on the top, we've got a picture showing something. I have no idea what it is, so we better turn the page. Page 8. Technology Pyramid. So on the top of my technology pyramid, I had data networking across a wide variety of things. On the bottom of my pyramid, I have some mechanical electrical device that does something. Okay, and, I have, and I have things going on. Isn't that wonderful? You want to be somewhere around uh, seven, eight, and nine on that pyramid. You, you don't want to be at one. You don't. You don't. You, know, you don't want to be the guy putting the part in the machine. You, know, you want to be the guy sitting in the front office watching the computer do what it does. Yeah. Then the technology tree on page nine. This is even worse. You like that? For those that don't have a book, yeah. You know, luckily, this book does not have transparency, so I don't have to worry about it. 
Yeah, I have things that are discrete, some that are analog, some are manual machines, electronically controlled machines. Isn't that lovely? All right, turn the page. Troubleshooting and solving problems. That's where we come in. We are paid in full because there are problems, and we get to solve them. That's all we have to do. But remember, never tell the boss how you did it. Okay. So the assembly line's not working, it's down, you're supposed to go in and fix it. You go in, you plug it in, it's now powered up, it works. You don't come back and, and tell the boss that you just plugged in the, the plug. Okay, You don't do that. I fixed it, that's what you pay me to do. Go back to your office. Right. Right. But 90% of the things that we will repair in our job as an electronic technician will be turning on the power. Yes. Why is that? Because that's right, because somebody else didn't do it yet, right? Exactly. Somebody else didn't do the job. Troubleshooting is just a simple, multiple step process. And if you memorize it, you're not going to get to the end. Um, the, the, industri the, the car industry has a really cool thing going on. I mean, they, they put those computers in your car now, and you stick it up, you know, plug in, plug into the computer in the car, and the car tells you what's wrong. And then you, you go replace that thing, and totally amazing. Um, consumer electronics, you throw it away, you don't even bother. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So um, the mom and pop repair shops that are out there to repair things are struggling because even if I bring some, even if I have a microwave I bring in for them to repair, they could do it, but uh, you can buy a new one cheaper. So why, why would you bother? But our industrial complex requires us to maintain it. You're not going to throw the whole plant away because something's broken. It that that wouldn't work. Hardware versus software. So there was a time up to uh, probably 1975. We'll, we'll pick 1975. Um, prior to 1975, the auto industry would take 30 days off every August. If I can spell days. And what were they doing? They were retooling for the new car model. So they were using relay logic in their control systems. They spent the entire year before August building those systems in shops up from scratch. Um, uh, in August 1, they'd yank out all the old control system out of the plant. They'd install the new ones that they'd built. They tested it. On the 1st of September, the first car would come out, out of the assembly line. From 1975, and that's a, a, a date that's there, it might be 10 years either side, but it can't be 10 years earlier, but it could be 85. Uh, they went to computerized systems to do the ladder logic to control the assembly line. So now you could go and, and, and have an assembly line making this year's Mustang. You could go home, the midwatch could go and load a new software into the computer, and you could start up the next day making the next year's model. <laughs> a very interesting way of doing business. You're now not yanking everything out. You're not rewiring the yin-yang of everything, and, and so that's just the way it is. Now, then we have things like the U.S. Air Force. And the U.S. Air Force has many things, right? We'll just talk about some top secret ones that are hanging out at Offutt Air Force Base. But there are five planes at Offutt Air Force Base, um, and uh, they're command and control planes. And uh, what they're what they're supposed to do is um, detect the enemy's radar and communications. That's what they're supposed to do. So every time some some third world country installs some new radar that um, wasn't there last year, someone has to go in the plane 
put in a new motherboard, put in a bunch of wires, upgrade the software to detect that new radar threat. Okay, that seems reasonable. How many people does it take to do that? Am I allowed in a top secret plane by myself running wires? No. So there's a two-man rule involved. There has to be two of you. You have to know what you're doing. There has to be a third person checking out that the other two did it right. Okay, all, the, all that stuff comes into play. So whatever you do, it, it'll, it'll be career intensive. Now, the people that do that, did they have a DUI when they were 18 years old? No. Do they have a 20-year Sunday school pin? Yes. So you're going to need a top secret clearance. Uh, about five years ago, we placed a guy in that job. He had three DUIs before his 18th birthday. Um, they figured it out within five weeks and, and had to lay him off. So uh, don't apply for that job if you can't pass the security clearance. But it's a high-paid job. It's a really great job. Every five years, they fly those planes to Texas. They gut the entire plane and rebuild it from scratch. That's the other part of the job that you want. If, if you like warm weather in Texas. If you don't like warm weather in Texas, you don't want to do that. Okay, so that's, that's what the Air Force is doing. Hardware versus software. So they can do some software stuff. Every five years they're going to do Oh, uh, how about this one? Who is this? Who has been? Who was? Who is hmm, the smartest president ever? Anybody know? Yes. Modern, well, we'll go modern history. You know, since, since World War II. Who's the smartest president since World War II? Johnson? Uh, we'll go with Bush. <laughs> so, we'll go with Bush. Just, just to go there. Now, think about this. It, it's, uh, yeah. It's 2000. He's just inaugurated. <coughs> And uh, we have this thing over here. It's called China. 2000? Yeah. Year 2000. Yeah. Got it? Right. The, uh, yeah, we have this thing called China. And over here we have something called Alaska. Okay, so in, uh, out of Alaska we fly a, uh, a reconnaissance plane. And we do it at least once a week. We leave Alaska. We fly down here. We fly the coast of China. Uh, we're off about 200 miles off the coast or so. Then we turn around and we come back and we land. Now every single week, how much data do we get? Zero, zappo, nothing. Why, did, why zero, zappo, nothing? Well, because in Alaska, there's a Chinese operative sitting at the airfield. When the plane takes <laughs> off, he picks up the phone, calls his friend over in China. As the plane gets closer to the coast, all the radars shut down on the coast in order, and they come back on as we go away. No, no information at all. Zero, zappo, nothing. All right, well, this seems like a waste of time, right? And uh, the Chinese, are they really our friends in the year 2000? No, they weren't all that real friendly, right? All right, so one day in April, uh, he takes this plane and um, he puts a, a lieutenant junior grade in charge. Anybody know what a lieutenant junior grade is? That's somebody senior to an ensign. That's sort of like a first lieutenant. Yeah. So on the battlefield, does the first lieutenant make too many decisions on his own? No. He puts 30% of the crew, he has his female. Okay? So the senior guy on board is, a, is, is an O2, um, uh, lieutenant junior grade. Um, a third of the crew is female. And the plane has 386 technology on board. You know, there were 386 computers, and there were 46, right? And then there's 46 DX, and then there was Pendium 1. Anybody have any Pendium 1 still running in their house? 
and then there's Pentium twos, and then there, yeah. <coughs> so in the year 2000, the 386 computer was a piece of crap. Now, the only thing worse than that would be a PS2, <coughs> which is 286 technology. Anyway, the Lieutenant Junior Grade flies his plane down, <coughs> and about the time all the all the radars turn off, and about the time he's getting around to uh, go the other way, um, the Chinese come out and play with him, and he collides with. He's just. He's no good, so he collides with a, a Japanese pilot, fighter pilot. The Japanese fighter pilot dies. And we, that's really too bad. But now the lieutenant junior grade is there, and his plane is hurt. It's got a hole in it where the, where the, where the guy hit his plane. Right Now, anybody senior at all in the military knows that what you should do with your with your with your top secret plane in a case like this is get as close to the deepest water you can and sink it there, right? He, he, he thinks he can't go back. But because he's such a, a junior nub, he doesn't know to do that. So what he does is he gets on the radio, mayday, mayday, I'm going down, and flies directly into China <laughs> and lands on the, the first big airfield he can find, big enough to do his plane. Now, as soon as he turns yelling, mayday, mayday, I'm, I'm going down, and yeah, going this way, all the radars on the Chinese coast light up. All the command and control communications guys light up. Every, everybody that we've been trying to listen to for the last 10 years lights up and starts a asking permission to shoot him down. Now, uh, whether or not Bush told the political side of China that this might happen sometime, I don't know. I don't know that part of the story, but anyway, he lands at the base. They circle it with, with their with all their their squat team guys, and you know, out comes this lieutenant junior grade who's in charge with his female crew. They don't know what to do with the females. You know, they know what to do with guys. You throw them in a prison or war camp. You don't feed them. You starve them. You, you know. <coughs> but what do we do with the females? What are we gonna do? Um, the face, faces is something that's very important to the Chinese. The face of the military in China was lost when this happened to them. The political side of China, their face increased. So since that time, we haven't had much of a problem with Chinese, for the Chinese. In your lifetime, the Chinese haven't been much of a problem. And when was the last time we talked about some military operation trying to take Formosa? or something like that. That hasn't happened in a long time, right? This is why. They landed their plane. Um, now, the, uh, the top secret stuff on the plane can be removed by taking a switch from this position and putting it in that position. You, the crypto is all gone by zing it out. It's called zing it out. You click. So the entire plane is, is unclassified before it even enters the airspace. Anything the Chinese got off of it, and they, they took everything off, um, was old technology, <laughs> which, which was totally useless. The plane was scheduled to be decommissioned anyway. It was 20 years old. Um, they had to get a, a um, one of the great big uh, Russian transports came in. They loaded the plane on the transport and gave it back to the United States in pieces uh, six months later. And um, anyway, who would have thought? That's what I say, you know, smartest president ever. Biggest threat, the Chinese, he didn't have it anymore for his entire administration. We still don't have a threat from the Chinese now. You know, they're building, they have an aircraft carrier. Do we care? Anybody tell you we care about the Chinese aircraft carrier? No. So you probably, you probably haven't heard that short story. Anyway, software versus hardware. So the hardware of the plane was old and decrepit. The software could be wiped out by turning one switch. Um, you'd ex a lieutenant junior grade knows nothing, right? If you had a colonel on board, the colonel would know all kinds of top secret stuff, right? right. Yeah, exactly. In World War II, the USS Tullaby um, went down with three people on board. 
um, the diving officer and ensign lost control and um, broached the ship in front of a destroyer. Uh, they got hit by a couple shells. The crew abandoned ship. The ship went down with the ensign and with the Commodore on board. Okay. Cromwell was his name. Now, why did the Commodore... The captain left. Why did the Commodore go down with the ship? What kind of Navy tradition is that? In World War II, we did not tell our commanding officers we broke the Japanese code. But their bosses knew. The Commodore knew we broke the Japanese code. He also knew that if he was captured, he would probably tell <coughs> after being tortured enough. And so he chose to go down with the ship. Um, posthumously, at the end of the war, he got a Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, two of the crew members survived the prisoner of war camp. And in 1995, there's still one of them alive. He, he has since died. So anyway, what are the solving problems, troubleshooting hardware versus software? Are we done with this chapter yet? Mixing trouble. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, well, that means we can start working problems. Notice that, that uh, on page 21 there's some websites you can go look at. I've, I've never found a student ever to go look at them. <coughs> In case you wanted to know something else, there's something else. There. <coughs> All right, now, as I recall, we're supposed to do problems 1 through 4 and 11. Is that true? Anybody remember that syllabus? That's what, that's what it said? All right. All right. So problem number one. Problem number two. Problem number three. Good thing I brought my calculator. Number four and then 11. Looks like this is going to take me approximately an hour. All right. All right, so we're going to do number one. Number one. What? 23. 23. So I've got, um, I got a chart here. And I want to know how many ohms, how many kilo ohms, how many mega ohms, That was good for mega. Mega ohms. What's the last guy? In the tolerance. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. And um, maybe I should do this on a spreadsheet. Who knows? All right, so I've got a, a red, yellow, and orange are the colors on my resistor. Now, somebody tell me. Where in chapter one did it ever talk about color coding of resistors? Anybody see that in the book anywhere? Yeah. All right. So the author must be just blowing smoke by us, right? All right. But he tells us use the standard color code of resistors and write each resistor in the table below in ohms, kilo ohms, and mega ohms. All right, so, and then he lists black, brown, red, yellow, orange, green, blue, violet, gray, white, gold, silver. What he doesn't tell us is what the damn things mean, right? So luckily he put them in order. So black is zero, brown is one, red is two, yellow is three, Orange is 4, green is 5, blue is 6, violet is 7, 8, 9, gold is, gold is what, 5%, gold is 5% and silver is 10%. Are I just making that up? Some of you still have your card in your pocket, right? Mm -hmm. Alright, so, if I have a red, a yellow, and an orange, then that means red is a 2, 
yellow is a 3, orange is a 4. Okay, so I got that. So what this is telling me is 2, 3, first digit, second digit. The 4 is how many zeros? 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. Alright, so I'm going to write this as 23,000 ohms. I'm going to write that as 230 kilo ohms. What? What's the question? Am I okay? And I'm going to write that as point zero point two three mega ohms. Tolerance, there is no tolerance, so I don't have to put one down. So that's what I'm doing. So I've got resistance, which the board will tell us is fulo. And resistance is in ohms. I could have kilo ohms, which means 10 to the third ohms, or I could have mega ohms, 10 to the sixth ohms. Yeah, those are things I could have. All right, next guy. I got, um, is that brown? Brown, <coughs> white, blue, green. Okay, so brown is one, white. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, zero. So I'd be at nine. White is a nine. Blue, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Blue is a six. And gold is five per, five percent. BL is black? BU okay, so that's a zero. Nine. So that's black for zero. Okay, so I got I got a nineteen. I have no more zeros. So that means I've, I've got 19 ohms. I've got 0 0.019 kil ohms. I have 0 0.000019 meg ohms. And why anybody would want to know that, I have no idea. I think the author is just blowing spoke, wasting time, doing review. I know why he's doing it. BL gold. And my tolerance is 5% because I'm gold. All right. Now I've got one, two, three, four, five more lines to do. All right. So we'll go in. Now, if we're smart about it, no, well, we're not. Number one continued. All right. So I've got ohms. Kill ohms, mega ohms. You know, I could do better than that, right? I've done better. Haven't I done better than that in the past? <coughs> Kill ohms, mega ohms. So we could go to this straight line dealy dab thingy here. And um, look at that. Look at how professional that looks. Now, it's disgusting how professional that looks, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, really. Anyway, so, um, orange, violet, green, silver. All right, so I'll put down 10% uh, because of the silver. All right. And then we say, well, orange, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So orange is a 4. Violet, 4, 5, 6, 7 is a 7. Violet green is a 5. And uh, silver is 10%. So we, we translated that. So that'd be a 4, 7. Who? Orange is three. I miscounted again. Orange is You know, I got these. I have these brand new trifocals. It seems like I should do better than that. Orange. Zero, one, two, three. Wait a minute. Zero, one, two, three, four. Orange is four. Orange is three. Orange is yellow is four. They got them in back order. 
They put him. Wow, that's pretty hosed. <laughs> hosed again. Three seven five. So three seven and five. One two three four five zeros. Nice. Three seven zero 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 zero. Three seven zero zero k ohms. Three point seven k ohms. Well, I'm not going to go back and correct something I've already done. That's on a previous page. So who put the yellow and the orange out of order? Well, the author did. Is this a first edition book? Yeah, this is a first edition book. All right, well, that solves that problem. Right. Yeah, not gonna... Hmm? Yeah. Oh, I uh, misspelled mega. You know, I do that on purpose just to see if the class is watching. Yeah, I sure does. Uh, okay, so this is green. What's gr? Gray, gray, red. Okay, right, so green, gray, red. Green. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, red, two. All right, so I'd be a five and eight with two zeros. All right, so I'd be five, eight hundred ohms, five point eight k ohms, zero point zero zero five eight meg ohms, and I don't have a tolerance, so I don't have to write it down. All right, so now I've got three more to do. All right, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to go in. I think this will work. Copy. Edit. Paste. All right, and then we can go in. Use the big eraser. And then we just use my pretty thing all over again. All right, so where are we? Violet, yellow, black, green, no, gold. So gold is 5%. We'll write that down first. All right, so violet, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that'd be a 7. Yellow. Zero, one, two, three, four. That'd be a four. Yellow, black. Black is a zero. All right. So that's be seventy four with no more zeros. That's gonna be seventy four <coughs> ohms. Zero point zero seven four kilo ohms, which I'd never write it that way. And zero point zero 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 seven four mega ohms, and I'd never write it like that either. Um, and at that point, anybody looking at the clock, which you can't do because you put it in the back of the room so you can't be clock watchers, but I'll, I'll do a recheck. Yeah, this says 1140. That says 1140. So everything says 1140, which means the class has to be over. And that leaves me two hours to do the rest of the homework problems in chapter one. Do you think I can make it? <coughs> it might be difficult. It might it might be. It might be difficult. But it is a Wednesday, right? It is a Wednesday, so there will be donuts. All right, now, control. Uh,